Hello again and welcome back to the Day of the Bible Study. We're going to continue on with Paul's letter to the Romans. We're in chapter 2. We're going to start in verse 17. And we're going to pick up, Paul talked about one side of things. Uh, and he's going to talk about the other side today. Before you, let's pray. Uh, loving God, you know, Paul is writing to a group of Christians, some of whom have a Jewish ethnicity and some of them have a non-Jewish or Gentile ethnicity. And yet, Lord, you are speaking also to us. Uh, you're helping us to see who we are. And so, Lord, help us to hear, as those who are historically the people of God, uh, at least in this place, in this time, Lord, help us to, to hear the words that you have given to those who were the people of God at that time and in that place. Help us to learn what they needed to learn, because we probably need to learn it too. Lord, we ask you to be with us, send your Holy Spirit upon us, for we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. So Paul was talking before about, he says, you know, if people don't have the law and yet they are living consistently with the law, it is showing that God is, work, is kind of writing the law on their flesh. And so Paul is going to really turn around and criticize the, the Jewish people uh, for their perceived arrogance and what they do. So this is what Paul says starting in, in verse 17. He says, but if you bear the name Jew and rely upon the law and boast in God and know his will and approve the things that are essential, being instructed out of the law, and are confident that you yourself are a guide to the blind, a light to those who are in darkness, a corrector of the foolish, a teacher of the immature, having in the law the embodiment of knowledge and of the truth, you therefore who teach another, do you not teach yourself? You who preach that one shall not steal, do you steal? You who say that one should not commit adultery, do you commit adultery? You who abhor idols, do you rob temples? You who boast in the law through your breaking the law, you dishonor God. For the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles because of you, just as it is written. So um, Paul is kind of making a big blanket statement, and he's kind of making a big blanket condemnation over the whole group of people. Uh, all the Jewish Christians, either in general or all the Jewish Christians in Rome, uh, he's criticizing them. And I can imagine that if you were a Jewish Christian at the time, and if you were a Roman Jewish Christian at the time, you would take offense at his blanket statement because you'd want to say, well, yeah, I don't do those things. But what we're, so Paul is highlighting some specific Gentile things. You know, these are things that God has said not to do, but do you do them? And um, it is hard for me to believe that every single Jewish person is guilty of, of those things. Um, and, and yet, you know, uh, he does do a thing. This is, again, this is Paul's version it's almost like this, this is the most James that Paul gets in all of his writing because we see these as being really close parallels to some of the things that, that James has said. You know, James says it this way. He talks about, you know, yes, you might not commit law A, you might not violate law A, but if you violate law B, guess what? You're still a lawbreaker. If you violate law A, you're a lawbreaker. If you violate law B, you're a lawbreaker. If you violate some other law, you're a lawbreaker. And he says, regardless of the nature of the sin, you know, if we violate um, the, the commandments. We violate the law of God in any way. We are lawbreakers. And so, yeah, we might not all be adulterers. We might not all be murderers. We might not all be, you know, thieves, but we're all lawbreakers. And that is the standard by which we need to measure ourselves. And Paul is basically doing the same thing. He lists a few things, you know, but uh, surely there's going to be somebody there who says, well, you know, I, I preach against stealing and, and I don't steal. I preach against adultery. I don't commit adultery. Uh, I preach, um, you know, those kind of things. But, but, but Paul then does the catch-all where he says, you who boast in the law through your breaking of the law, do you dishonor God? And I imagine it would be really hard for any uh, Jewish person to be able to say, um, no, I never, ever have broken the law. You know, I find it very difficult to believe that. Um, and then, and what, what really, the rubber meets the road, and I think this is something that we absolutely need to hear, and it's a fitting kind of conclusion for our week, our first week of looking at Romans, is uh, Paul uh, quotes somebody. He's, uh, it says here that he was quoting from Isaiah uh, or Ezekiel, um, or both. And uh, he says, for the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles because of you. And at least the way it seems to be applying here in Romans, um, I haven't, I, like I said, the part of this is that to have little preparation so I haven't looked up exactly the context in Isaiah and Jeremiah or Ezekiel, and that would be a good thing to do. But um, at least how Paul's using it here is you have this idea of, um, yes, Jewish people, he says, you know the law. Great. I'm glad you know the law. I wish everyone would know the law. And he's going to come back to that idea over and over again, where the law really is a good thing. And just because some people are misusing it does not make the law somehow bad. But he says, I, 
if you know the law and you identify as those who are the law, then actually your sin is much, much worse. Because it's one thing to be a sinner when you don't know any better. And everyone knows you don't know any better. You know, how could someone possibly live according to the, the Jewish law if they have no connection with the Jewish law? You know, well, of course the Gentiles are caught up in sin. Of course they are. How could they possibly know what it means to be a sinner? How could they possibly know what they need to do to avoid sin? They wouldn't, you know. But if you're a Jewish person, if your whole persona, if your whole identity is I belong to God, I'm part of the people of God, um, then, then it's going to reflect differently. Because now your sin is not just a problem with you, it's a problem that reflects on God. And he says the Gentiles think poorly of God because of you. The people in, so, so he's always speaking with the Jewish people, but I think it's important for us in the church too. You know, there are people in the church who behave badly, and there are individuals who identify as Christians who behave badly. And within the church, it's not just a problem for that person anymore, because now the people of the world look at that and they say, oh, that's how Christians behave. That's the kind of person that a Christian is. I want them to do with that. And it works against the, 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 the gospel. And we often want to distinguish ourselves from them. So well, they're not part of us and all the rest. But this is part of the reason why in the early Methodist uh, movement, you know, John Wesley would, would remove people from membership because there were people who were literally being beaten uh, sometimes to death uh, because of what people were saying about the Methodists. And there's, there were riots that happened uh, having to do with the Methodists, accusing the Methodists of various things. And you know, one of the things that John Wesley was saying is if there's anybody, anybody who is giving any reason for people to believe these things, if anything we're doing is somehow making it easier for people to believe that the Methodists are as evil as the, as the rumors we're making, it seems that they've got to go. They cannot be part of our group. They cannot be associated with us because they will simply amplify, they will amplify the persecution and they will undermine our ability to witness. And what Paul's saying here is, is congratulations Jewish people. You all feel great. That's great. Wonderful. I understand that. But you need to realize every time you violate what God's about. Every time you do what is wrong and stand in judgment over somebody else, you are weakening and undermining these things because now the whole world looks at the Jewish people here or the church today and says, you're a bunch of hypocrites. And Paul says, that's not good. The, the, the Gentiles blaspheme the name of God because of us. And I think to myself, you know, boy, you know, I don't want that to happen. Uh, and I would like to think that I live my life most days as someone who does not put fuel on that fire. And yet there's a very real concern about what does it mean you know, in what ways do I, in my own struggle with sin, in my own struggle with trying to be who God has called me to be, uh, when, I, when I drop the ball, when I fail to be all I'm supposed to be, does that draw attention to God in a way that, that paints a picture of who God is that's, that's not uh, sovereign in power and glory and transformation? I read an article recently about two pastors. Uh, they, they were both kind of high-profile pastors at one point, and they both served churches that had the same name but in very different parts of the country. And one of them had what was perceived to be a theological failing, and they were absolutely shunned by, by people. And the other person had, uh, did not have a, a theological failing but had some pretty egregious moral failings, really behaved very, very badly and aggressively and in a way that is, that is by any measure destructive to people and destructive to the church. And a couple of years later, started a new church. Uh, people still you know, kind of have this general respect for him because this idea of we tend to say, well, you know, we're all sinners. And we have very little patience for someone who makes a theological misstep or even embraces something that's wrong and where the solution would be correction. Um, but we have, very, we have lots of patience um, for someone who agrees with me, who I see as being part of my camp, who has egregious moral failings. And the question becomes, how do we uh, behave justly in both circumstances and not just... Um, in some circumstances. You know, I think about, you know, it's one thing, so if, if I see myself as being part of a camp, part of a group, and there's somebody outside of that camp, um, you know, it's tempting to think of, well, everything they do is bad. So anything I can highlight that will highlight how bad they are, I want to really emphasize. But anybody who points something bad about me or my group, I kind of want to downplay because I don't want to seem as the bad guy. And I think there's a huge amount of temptation for us. I, I saw on a major news network, and I, I always tell people I don't want to name the news network, but just assume it's the one you watch because my point is I think we do this all in general. And they said, you know, I know I don't know anything about this issue that was big in politics at the time. He said, but I know it's got to be good because of how mad it makes the other side. And this is not a way to live as Christians. This is not a way to live where we define ourselves as being against them rather than being for Jesus. So um, what I take from this passage is a reminder of if we as Christians, if we as the church are behaving in ways that are driving people away from Jesus, if we are behaving in unloving, uncaring ways that treat our own sins very lightly and the sins of other people as being very dangerous, uh, we are working against the gospel, and we have got to repent once again. And I, whenever I see this in myself, I want to get back on my knees and say, Lord, I'm sorry. 
you know, and I want to apologize to the people out in the world that I've misled uh, at various points in my life. And, and I hope <laughs> that I'm not doing that today. Um, so as we finish this week, uh, you know, I, I encourage you to be thinking there this kind of Christmas season as we're gearing up for the last days before Christmas, you know, say, Lord, uh, you came to save sinners and I'm a sinner. How can I be a better witness for you? How can I be a more transparent uh, messenger for who you are? Well, that's all for today. That's all for this week. Uh, come back next week. We'll continue on with more of the, uh, Paul's letter to the Romans. Have a good day.